I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you know the two men who were the first to have accomplished uh, manned and motorized flight? How many of you know the, the, their names? Raise your hand. The first people, right? Who, who were their names? Orville and Wilbur Wright. Very good. How many of you have heard, now that I say the name, you're like, oh yeah, those are the guys, right? Okay? Most of you. Um, did you know that there was another, another man who was trying to accomplish manned and motorized flight at the same time as Orville and Wilbur Wright? And actually, he seemed like the more likely candidate. He uh, had been trained at Harvard as a scientist. He was actually a world-renowned astronomer. He um, had lots of resources. The War Department had given him a $50,000 grant, which is a lot of money today, but in 1903, you can imagine, that was a lot of money. He had also been given a $20,000 grant, $20, grant from the Smithsonian Institute. He was the director of the Smithsonian Institute at the time, and he was very connected. Politically, he knew a bunch of, you know, important people. Uh, he knew a bunch of businesses. He seemed like the likely man that was going to achieve this feat before anybody else. But he wasn't. How many of you have heard his name? You guys know? Some of you might know who he is because you know the story. His name was Samuel Pearson Langley. Now that I say Langley, you've probably heard his name. But not connected to the flight, right? It's always the Wright brothers. They were the ones. But what about them? How were they prepared or set up to discover this discovery of discoveries, right? That changed the world as we know it to this day. Well, do you know what their business was? What their profession was? They, were, uh, they owned a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. They fixed bicycles. They sold bicycles. They worked on them. They engineered some of their own. So they knew how things worked, right? They hadn't finished their high school uh, they hadn't gotten their high school degrees. They hadn't finished high school, either one of them. They're from Dayton, Ohio, had no political connections, had no fanfare, not a lot of media attention. They just kind of under the radar, no pun intended, right? Uh, under the radar, began to work and discover on how to control an airplane, you know, in the air so that a man, a person, could, could fly it and then not crash into the ground and die, right? That they could control it. And that's where the airplane was birthed. So, do you want to change the world? Do you want to be a part of God's work in transforming the world? In finding where there's hopelessness, where the gates of hell have prevailed until now, right? Where there's hopelessness and injustice and pain, and brokenness. You want, to, you want to find that place and then bring God's healing and hope and love and justice to that place? Do you want to be a part of that work? Who does God include on that work? Let's read our passage in Acts chapter 6. The Word of God says this, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, 
and of those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And that's where we'll end for today. In this passage, we see something very interesting going on. The church has been uh, growing, right? The church had gone from this group of 120 dedicated disciples at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, at his ascension, right? Right after, the, about 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus ascends to his Father in heaven, and he leaves his church with this promise of the Holy Spirit and with this mission to do. And as they're sitting there, there's 120 of them, the angels are like, what are you waiting for, right? Why are you guys looking up at the heavens? It's time to get to work. And so they go back and they're awaiting the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes with power. And it, it empowers the church to be the witness. And then we see, as Peter preaches his sermon, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, that 3,000 people were added to their number that day, right? This explosive growth. And not only that do we see, but we also see that uh, they have this special kind of community among them. And it's this community where people are selling their goods, right, and selling their extra stuff, their extra land, selling their houses so that they can have this money that they can give to the church so that the church might be able to serve the needs of their community. They had widows in their community, and those widows, um, in, in our day and age as well, but definitely in that day and age, the widows were the most vulnerable. Oftentimes, widows didn't have a, an income, right? They didn't have a job. They didn't have a way of producing for themselves. And so they depended on their community. And so the church said, we are not going to have any needy among us. We will not have any widows who, who go without. We want to take care of our widows. And they had this, this radical generosity towards their own. And so as this, the church is growing, they also start to have kind of these growing pains, as, the, as God adds to their number, their number gets to be such that this distribution of the funds to the widows becomes uh, sort of difficult, difficult uh, in an administrative sense. Um, they have a lot more widows to take care of now. They have a lot more funds to distribute. And so uh, they find themselves in kind of an administrative predicament where the, the, not all of the resources that they have are getting to the people who really need it. But it wasn't just a problem of administration. They also had an ethnic problem. As you notice, there are two groups here in this passage. One group are called the Hellenists, and we can also call them the Greeks, right? The Greek Jews. Both of these groups are Jews. Both of them love the God of the Bible, right? The living God, the Old Testament. And now these are believing Jews, so they believe in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So both of these groups are Jewish groups, but they're separate groups. Like I said, one of them was Greek or Hellenist, and then the other was the Hebraic, or the Jews that lived in Israel and spoke uh, Aramaic. Now, the Hellenist Jews were the ones that had been dispersed about 100 years before this. They had been taken captive, and they had been taken to all the different provinces of Greece at the time, right? And so they were raised in Grecian culture. They were raised in Greek homes. And even though they, they held on to their faith, the faith of their fathers, right? In many ways, they were like the Greeks, and culturally speaking. Um, as you can imagine, as, as you are raised in a culture, you just kind of take on, you know, parts of those culture, right? So they were still Jews, but now they were experiencing um, this, uh, this conversion to Christ, and they come together, and Christ's community was different, right? Christ's community was accepting from all groups, as we're going to see the Samaritans, who used to be outside of the Jewish culture, are going to be a part of Jewish culture. And soon after that, we're going to see that the Gentiles of all nations begin to convert to Christ, and they become, and they're part of the church. As Paul said, there is no longer Jew or Greek, right? The, the dividing line between these groups have been demolished, and so uh, we're all one in Christ, but the Christian church is experiencing these people who are uh, going back to the old lines, going back to the old understanding of culture. And so uh, in that, something got lost in the shuffle. So the disciples, as they're just 12 of them, right, and they're taking on more and more responsibility, and they're preaching the word of God, 
right? They preached it in the temple courts, and they also taught the word of Christ from house to house as they had been commanded. And as they were doing that, and the church was dedicating themselves to the apostles' teaching, the demands on their time got more and more stringent, more difficult. And so the, the attention that they were you know, putting towards the distribution of the goods that they had for all of the widows started to get less attention and be less effective. They were being pulled away. They were being pulled in two different directions, right? And so they were being less effective in that. And in that, um, maybe naturally, and maybe there's some sort of ethnic tension here, but the Greek Jews were not getting the funds that they needed for their widows. And so there was a complaint leveled against the apostles and leveled against the church saying, hey, we're a part of this community too, and we're not getting it, but we notice that the Hebrew Jews, are, their widows are taken care of. What's going on here? Are we being discriminated against? What's the problem? And of course, the, the, the disciples, the apostles realized, like, we need to take care of this. We need to do something about this. And this is what they say. They say that we can't dedicate ourselves to this ministry. It's an important ministry. Well, we must dedicate ourselves to the preaching of God's word and to prayer. So we need to raise up leaders, raise up people who God will use to take care of this need. And that brings us to our first point in our, in our outline, that the people that God uses see needs and respond. The people that God uses see needs and respond. And we see this in, like I said, in a couple of areas. The, the disciples are saying, we have this need, this, this need of reconciliation of these two groups. We have this, that's a spiritual need, right? And a cultural need. We also have this need of the distribution for the widows. We have widows that are going hungry, and that can't be. We need to solve this problem. And so the disciples make sure, and they do something about it. And the people that they appoint, right? Notice that they appoint seven men. And those seven men are, are saying, I'm here. You got a need? I'll do it. We're here. We offer our services. We offer our time. We offer our hearts. We want to help in this way. The people that God uses see needs and they respond. But there's also a spiritual need here. It's not just, uh, we need warm bodies that can take this food over to a widow's house. Can anybody do that? Uh, I can do that. No, but they, they, they were looking for people who were full of wisdom, of good repute, right? They had a good testimony. And their testimony wasn't just that they uh, were not living in open sin. We're going to talk about that a little later. But they, were, they, were, uh, they had favor with the people, right? They knew how to work with people, that they could go and spend time and love on and serve a widow and not just serve physical needs. So they're responding to spiritual needs here as well. The second point in our outline is that the people that God uses stop making excuses for their lack of involvement. And for this, we're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 9. The book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. At, at first glance, this passage seems a little harsh. Right? We, seem, we feel like Jesus is kind of being a little bit too much. Because, I mean, these seem like good excuses, don't they? I mean, if you're going to have an excuse, these are good ones. I need to bury my dead father. I need to go say goodbye to my family. But I think what Jesus is doing here is that he's cutting through these false 
excuses, right? He's, he's saying like, he's saying, okay, follow me. The, the kingdom of God is near. It's right here. And it's your opportunity. You can follow me and be a part of it. And who knows what these people will do, but oftentimes we, we're good at making good excuses, right? We've, we've got great excuses that nobody can say anything against, right? We say, oh, well, you know, like I've got, I've got my, my dead father, and who's going to say, oh, uh, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Come with me, right? Don't take care of that. I mean, that's a great excuse, of course. But I think Jesus is just cutting through these excuses because really they're false excuses, right? Really, they're just ways of, of layering before I actually make a decision. I, I don't want to commit yet, and so I'm going to give myself some protection. I'm not quite ready to go all in, so I'll make sure and give myself a buffer, and I'll do it with really good excuses. And, and Jesus confronts each one. We see the first one where he says, I will follow you wherever you go. He might have even said this in front of a few people, right? Because that's quite the grandiose statement. Oh, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And he says, oh, well, where I'm going, it gets pretty uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, You know, foxes have homes, birds have nests, but I don't have a place to lay my head sometimes. So it might get uncomfortable for you. If you follow me, it might be uh, like a sacrifice for you. It might get uncomfortable. And he is confronting the excuse that we we have in our minds that Jesus can't surely be calling me to leave the comfort of the life that I have right now. No, no, no. Why would he call me out of the comfort of the life? I got a good life. Things are going well for me. The second excuse that he confronts is the one that says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And in a sense, this is something that obviously somebody should take care of. But it is also a way of saying... God, or Jesus, I'm not, I'm not quite ready to get involved because I've got some things in my past that I need to take care of. He's confronting the excuse of, I've got to take care of my past before I can be useful for my future in God's kingdom. And Jesus says, listen, you want to follow me, follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. I mean, your, your father has passed on. There's I mean, it's done. There's nothing that you can do for him, but if you follow me, you can spread hope to the rest of the world, that they might find their hope in Christ and that they're going to die too someday. And they can be saved through this message and you can be a part of that. Leave your past in the past. It's time to step forward into service and into following me. Another excuse that he confronts, he says, I will follow you, Lord, but, of course, there's always a condition, right? Like, I will follow you, but there's something that I have that needs to be attached to your petition for me to follow you. Here's my condition. Let me first say farewell to those at my house. Again, a good one. But it really belies this idea that my family is still priority. My family is still more important than the kingdom of God. My family ties take precedent in my life, and they are more important than God's kingdom. What are our good excuses? We all have them. And we're continually having them. We all have good excuses for, for why we are not more involved in what God's calling us to do. I've got them. Here's, one of the, here's some of, that I have thought of. Here's the first one. When I get blank figured out, then I'll get involved. And each of us have a different blank. You know, when I get blank figured out, well, then I'll be ready to go. Watch out, kingdom of God, because after I get this thing figured out, I'm coming. And what is yours? We can say marriage, right? You know, I I can't serve God because I'm still still trying to find a spouse. You know, can't do it. I got to get that figured out. Or what about career? I can, God, look, I'm building a career here. It's going to take some time. But when I get to this certain level, which I don't know what that is yet, but when I get there, I'll know, right? Uh, when I get there, then, then I can, I'll be able to serve you. I'll be able to get involved in your kingdom. I'll be able to be used by you then. But right now, 
Just lay off. I'm going to do the bare minimum. Once I get the career figured out, then I'll be ready for you. Oh, God, I have kids. Man, you know what it's like to have kids, right? And they take up a lot of energy and a lot of time. And, you know, we've got taekwondo, jujitsu, karate. We have every martial art you can imagine, right, to go to. And we just, I just can't get involved with your kingdom because we just got too much stuff to do. Or finances. God, I don't have a lot to offer. I'm just barely making it myself. So how could you use me? House. God, when we get our house figured out, then we'll be ready to roll. What is your, the blank for you? What's your good excuse? And let's, let's go deeper into that one that I don't have much to give. Does God usually work with great resources that people have? I and mean, if we look how Jesus worked often, it was with the absolute minimum. And he multiplied it way beyond what anybody could imagine. I mean, when he, when he feeds the 5,000, right? What does he use? Does he go to a caterer and say, hey, you've got, you know, I can multiply it only if you've got 25% of what we need. He uses a child, right? The child's like, oh, there's a need? Okay, here, this is what I got. Is this useful? I've got just a few bread and fish. Can you use these? And Jesus says, of course I can. I'll take what you've got, even if it's minimal, the bare minimum, and I will multiply it for my glory and for the good of these people. And he fed 20,000 with that. And that's the way Jesus works. He takes addicts who have spent every last cent of theirs and have spent themselves, and he turns them into sober, healed people who can then help others. He takes angry people and he transforms them to make them gentle. He takes greedy people and he makes them generous. He takes selfish people and he makes them selfless. He takes bitter people, haters, and he makes them peacemakers. God can take our lives and he can do great things with them only if we just put them in his hands and say, I'm willing. Use me. And this last excuse is probably the one that we use a lot, maybe the most, is I can't fit my involvement into my already busy life. What we're saying is all of the other things in my life are way more important, although we don't say it that way, right? We just say it with our lives. Everything else that I've got going on is more important than your kingdom and kingdom work. I can't fit it in. I mean, you, looked at, you look at my calendar, God, and you tell me where. And God just says, well, uh, I'll, I can help you, <laughs> right? Let me just turn it upside down. Let me just show you where the priorities are. If you lose your life for my sake, what does it say? You'll find it. I want all of you. And I want your son to be in jujitsu. And I want your daughter to be in ballet. And I want you to have fun things to do. But I don't want those things to take over your life in a way that you have nothing left to do what's eternally important so that you can, you can accomplish what is temporally important. All these things will be added unto you if you seek me first. Seek the kingdom first. And everything else will be in the place that it's supposed to be. So God uses people who stop making excuses for their lack of involvement. The next point in our outline is that God uses people who are capable but not perfect. God uses people who are capable but not perfect. Notice that the apostles were not chosen from the priestly class. Remember when Jesus went and called Peter, what, is, what was he doing? He was fishing. He was blue collar. He was from the country. He was from up in Galilee, right? And that's what the priests were always like, were so shocked about. Like, these guys, 
they, they're not well-spoken. These guys are from the country. You know, they've got a southern twang, you know. Like, these guys are, they're not educated. They don't have a master's degree. And then God used them to change the world. And what about these seven guys, right, in our passage? If we go back to Acts 6. The seven guys that they mention. Have you ever heard of their names before this point in the, in the Bible? This is the first time we hear of them, right? They just kind of like show up. Here we are, ready to go. Never heard of us. Who are these guys, right? We got Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing these correctly, right? Parmenas, Nicholas. And the interesting thing is like they're probably from all strata of life. We can just imagine, right? That Stephen, he used to be an HR, right? <laughs> uh, Philip was a contractor. Uh, Prochorus was unemployed. He's kind of had a dry spell in the employment area these days. Nicanor was a, a school teacher. Timon was a barista, you know. Par Parmenas was a cook. And Nicholas, uh, he works at Micron, because whenever you have seven guys in Boise, one of them works at Micron, right? <laughs> like, they all come from every strata of life, right? We don't really know. The word doesn't tell us, but we can imagine and then they get the call. They're like, hey, we've got these needs. Would you, guys, would you guys be willing? And they said, yeah, I'm here. Sign me up. I'm ready to go. And they just burst on the scene of the church. And this is the first time that we see them, but it won't be the last. Two of the names in here figure prominently in the next four chapters of Acts. And God uses them all, but he uses two of them in really special ways. And so they're capable and they're not perfect. We're not looking for, you know, master's degree or great resources or a ton of experience. We're just looking for a couple of things. And here's what they're looking for. They're looking for people who are full of wisdom. And we're going to demystify a little bit some of these terms of the Bible. Because sometimes when we read these things, they seem so holy. You know, oh, full of wisdom, right? Well, what does that mean? Really, it just means people who have common sense. Who are good at the nuts and bolts and the practical things of life. They're down to earth. They know how things work. They can help out in a specific way because they have a specific gifting. And so when they're full of wisdom, they know how to, how to do different things, right? They just have got some good knowledge. And so they're looking for people who are willing to use whatever knowledge they have and apply it to God's kingdom. And secondly, it says that they are full of the Spirit. And sometimes we can mystify that word as well. Like, full of the Spirit means that they need to be super spiritual. And that is not what that word means. What full of the Spirit means is that they are spiritual people. They care about spiritual things. They are growing in their relationship with Christ. Wherever they're at in their life, they're growing, right? That the fruit of the Spirit is, is showing itself in their life in different ways. Not in a perfect way, but it is showing itself, right? Right? The love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the long-suffering of Christ is coming through their character. It's bubbling up in different ways. That's what it means to be full of the Spirit. And that they love God. And that they love people. It's nothing super special. And that they, they said they're of good repute, and we already talked about that. That they weren't openly living in a life of sin. Again, it doesn't mean that they were completely sinless, right? I mean, they had their, their, their weaknesses, they had their things, but they weren't living a life completely against what Christ taught. They weren't saying with their mouth, oh, I love Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, and yet I'm going to live a life that completely is against everything that he taught, right? So we can't, we can't have that disparity because they're going to be on the front lines. They're going to be serving. And so we can't have them not be of good repute. They need, to, they need to demonstrate Jesus Christ to others. And so if they have a life of open sin and they're not struggling against it, they're not working towards uh, growth, then that would disqualify them, right, from being used. Because you can't give what you don't have. You can't pass on the love of Christ unless you are full of his love, right? You can't pass on righteousness. You can't be a good example of who, who Jesus is if, if that's not being worked out, at least, in your life. 
And so what's a conclusion about this for us? Is that God can still use you. I would say two things. Either today, all of us, every single one of us, right? You are either, you can be used of God right now in this moment. Or you're not that far from it. But we give ourselves excuses in this area too. We say, oh, well, you know, God knows that I'm struggling with sin. And so I can't serve. And so we just stay stagnant forever. We still kind of like, we're just, you know, being tossed about by this sin and we're not actually dealing with it. What I say is let's do it now. Let's deal with it now. Reach out to somebody. You can serve. You can be used by God. You're not that far from being able to be used by him. Reach out to to a staff member of our church. Reach out to a small group member, a friend that you have here in church and say, listen, I got something in my life that nobody knows about, but I need to tell you because I want want to, first of all, take care of this. I want to grow. I want to get rid of this, right? And I also want to serve the Lord. And I know this is keeping me from it. So if it is keeping you from it, then today's your day to say, I got to make a change. I'm going to deal with this so that God can use me. The next point in our, in our outline is that people, the people God uses are not afraid to wash dishes. Notice that Peter says in verse 2, he says, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And he's not saying this in like a disrespectful way, like, oh, that's below us. He's just saying, I realize that we need to serve tables and we're not doing a very good job, but we can't give up the preaching of God's word because the preaching of God's word is building his church. People are coming because the gospel is being preached and they're believing in Christ and they're being transformed. So we, we got to protect that. We can't, we can't neglect this in order to do this. So we'll just do a division of labor. We'll focus on this, which is our calling, and we'll raise up leaders who can focus on this, which is an important part of who we are, an important ministry. So he's not demeaning the ministry, but a lot of times serving tables is hard because it's not work that gets a lot of uh, attention. It's not work that, I mean, sometimes it's just work, right? It's a menial or mundane task. So the people who God uses are not afraid to wash dishes. People who God uses are, are not afraid to serve in the menial or the mundane tasks, and oftentimes without being asked, and most of the time without taking a selfie, right? <laughs> While they're vacuuming the church, right? Like, just serving the Lord, check it out, you know? <laughs> like, God uses people who have a joy in serving when nobody sees. Because we know that the person that we're serving is our Lord, is our God. And we don't really need for other people to recognize it. We just want him to see like, hey God, you served me, you came here, you died on the cross for me, and now all I can do is just serve you so that you know how much I love you and how grateful I am for what you've done for me. So I don't mind washing dishes. The people who God uses run towards problems, not away from them. The people who God uses love the unlovable and have compassion for the vulnerable. And that's a lot of times, those are difficult, right? But that's the the people God uses, love the unlovable and have compassion for the vulnerable. And Jesus gave his disciples this exact example, didn't he? He washed their feet. And washing feet in ancient times was one of the lowliest tasks. It was disgusting. It wasn't fun. It was work, and Jesus, on his last night on earth, or his last night before the crucifixion, I should say, he got down and he washed all of his disciples' feet. And then what did he tell them? He said, I did this for you as an example, that if I'm your master, and I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord of the universe, and I got down and washed your feet, then you need to do the same. You do this to one another. You do this to others, and you're carrying on my kingdom. You'll be used by me to change the world. Next point in in our notes is that the people that God uses start working before they're noticed. This is kind of similar to what we just talked about. Jesus tells a parable of the talents, and he says that those who are faithful with little 
will be given much. We're to be found faithful with little. You say, I want to serve, but I, you know, nobody's asked me to be senior pastor yet, so I guess I can't serve. And I, Wait a minute. Like, start with what you've got now, what's in front of you. We all have areas that we can serve. We have plenty of places to serve in our church. They may not be glamorous. They may not be uh, amazing. They may not get a lot of attention. They might be work. But they're places where you can serve the Lord. And lastly, the people that God uses don't put limits on how God can use them. Like I said, Philip, right, he starts out uh, serving tables, he starts out administering, he starts out ministering to widows, and then we see that God sends him to Samaria to preach to the Samaritans, and that the Samaritans, they convert to him in, in great number, this great work of God, because Peter, or Philip was faithful. And then he's sent to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, And he preaches the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. He disciples him and he helps him understand his need for Christ. And the Ethiopian eunuch is converted and he's baptized. And God used Philip for that too. And then God used Stephen in a great way, right? Stephen preaches the gospel to the Greek-speaking community. The the synagogue of the freedmen were these Greeks that had used to be slaves, but now they had come back to Jerusalem having bought their freedom. And they formed their own synagogue. So he goes to his people, speaking their language, and preaches the gospel in such a powerful way that nobody, nobody can, can refute him. They can't deny this power. And so what do you do? You either accept the message or you try to snuff out that voice. And that is what they tried to do. That's what they did. But by trying to snuff out his voice, they actually made his testimony greater. Because Stephen became the first to die for the name of Christ in the early church. And that testimony ended up surely as, a, as, a, as something that God used to convert many to his name. So they continued down the process that they started going. As, as God opened another door up for them to serve, they said, okay, I wasn't ready for it. I don't feel comfortable with it, but I'm going. If you're calling me to this direction, I'll go that way. If you open up this door, I'll go through it. I'm here to serve you. And so there are two things in the kingdom of God that we see, that the people that God used, there's no task too little for them. They're they're ready to do the most menial thing, the most mundane thing, if it serves the purpose of of his kingdom. And the second thing is that there's no task too big that God can't do through me if he wishes. So I'm willing to do whatever, and I'm willing to do big things if he wants it, if he wants to do it through me. I'm willing to do that. I'm not going to put conditions on how God uses me. He can use me as he wishes. As a church, we desire to be a multiplying community. In order to see God multiply us into more churches that can extend the kingdom even further into our valley and into our world, that means that every single one of us, all of us need to be all in. All of us need to say, need to cut through our excuses. What is the excuse that Jesus has pierced through today in your heart? And just as he's pierced it, just let it fall off and say, okay, yeah, you're right. Here I am. Use me. I don't have much to offer, but I want to be used by you. And at the end of my life, I want to say, my life was spent for the glory of God and to extend his kingdom.'"